Fox fans. Are you ready? You are listening to the Ducks and Pucks podcast with your hosts, Mike Walters and Eddie Jones. This is the number one home for Anaheim Ducks talk and analysis. Here we go. And welcome to the show. This is your host, Mike Walters, along with my co-host, Eddie Jones. And we're back uh, after uh, two weeks off. Uh, hope that you guys enjoyed your, your Christmas and New Year's and you know had a ho- happy holidays and whatnot. Uh, we've got plenty of action to get to. Uh, several games to cover. Obviously, the Ducks uh, on the road for a majority of the end of December there. So we're going to cover... Um, the end of the road trip, uh, the, you know, home game against the uh, Sharks, and of course the crazy game against Philadelphia that took place on New Year's Day. And then we'll get to tons of fan questions, a lot of good uh, things to talk about. Uh, Raquel Kessler, Gibson, uh, the lineup, uh, you know, going with seven defensemen in one of the games there. Uh, Montour coming up, and all those things that we're going to cover. But uh, you know, if we go back a little bit, Eddie, to when we talked on the last show, the Ducks were on that six game. Uh, road trip it was kind of a roller coaster there for the Ducks uh, alternating you know wins and losses uh, for the first five games and then of course losing that last one in overtime to Ottawa but uh, kind of the theme uh, to finish the year 2016 Eddie the uh, you know a little bit inconsistent play there and you know the Ducks uh, pulled out some close ones but you know also lost uh, a couple by a you know bad margin as well yeah I mean it was a little bit disappointing we we thought that they would uh, have a little bit better of a matchup against some teams. You know, Ottawa, we kind of hoped for a win in that one. They did end up getting a point. Uh, Toronto w- was a good game. They ended up winning there. You know, obviously the Montreal one a bit disappointing, but I believe it was on a back-to-back anyway. So, I mean, it, it sucks losing 5-1, um, but it, it's against a good team. We knew it was going to be a tough game, and, uh, I mean, we did pull out a win against them uh, earlier this season. So, uh, all in all, it was an okay uh, for a few uh, five games there, I think they they picked up a, a decent amount of points uh, to help them in the standings. Obviously, it can always be better, and, and we've kind of, we've kind of said that a multiple times this season. I mean, they've been good at times, but it could always be a little bit better. There's always a couple of mistakes they make that end up costing them a point. So, um, you know, I think all in all, it, it, was, it was an all right uh, start to the road trip. Yeah, they went on that road trip and they went, uh, you know, uh, two, three and one. And then after that, kind of a weird schedule. Uh, the Ducks came home, played San Jose for one game, then went back to Canada for Calgary and Vancouver. Uh, if you look at the game, you know, against the Sharks, um, you know, the Ducks, uh, they had the shots in this game. Um, they had the face offs. They, they didn't get too many power play uh, chances. Uh, the Sharks did score first in this one. Uh, the Ducks responded. Casse got a goal, um, and uh, Silverberg did as well. The tie in the third period and send it into overtime. And of course, you know the broken record, the story of overtime. The Ducks uh, ended up losing this one, uh, just as they had lost, you know, previously against Ottawa. And uh, you know, there's just not much you can say. They just don't pull it out in overtime. They, you know, they played a decent game against San Jose, and you know, I really thought they could win this one in regulation, Eddie. Yeah, uh, like you said, the penalty kill was good. You know, they're good in faceoffs. They outshot San Jose. They played a, a pretty strong game, and and again, they just they can't close out in overtime. Martin Jones was great in this game. Um, the the Ducks played a pretty solid game. They're you know another one goal game versus the Sharks this season. They've all been close. Uh, I mean, it's nice to get the point, but when you're playing a team like this, especially a team you're fighting to for the Pacific Division lead with. You know, it's always nice to get that extra point, and for some reason this season they just haven't been able to win a game in overtime. And uh, you know, when you're this far in the season, and you look at the amount of overtime losses that they've that they've uh, racked up. Uh, I mean, those are seven or eight points that you you've cost your team, and and those are big points right now. You you give them half of those points, and and they're right behind San Jose, if not in front of them right now. So, you know, they've got to figure out something here. I, I'm sure it's something they've been practicing as of late. Uh, because it's it's kind of becoming a, a nasty trend for the Ducks right now and not being able to close it out in overtime. Yeah, and you know, the killer here too with these overtimes, we notice that uh, is either misconnected passes uh, or trying to take a slap shot that doesn't go on net. 
Um, those are just killers. And, you know, that's what happened in this one. A pass that, you know, went errant and sprung, you know, the Sharks the other way. Burns ends up getting that, you know, game-winning goal. And that's something the Ducks are going to have to work on. You know, at this point, uh, you know, they're zero for six uh, after this game. Then they ended up going, you know, zero for seven uh, after the uh, Vancouver game, which we'll get to. But those appear to be some of the issues. Um, it looks like they're starting out with the right personnel. You know, they're usually going with Silverberg, Kessler, and Fowler to begin the overtime. Um they're getting Votnin out there, Raquel out there, Lindholm out there. Uh, you know, it's, it seems like they're at least getting um, the right type of matchups and stuff. But it's just when you're not getting the puck on the net and you're trying to do something too fancy with a shot or a pass, it just seems to come back and bite them in, in, in the end, Eddie. Yeah, and, you know, they, they get their chances, but it, it seems like when they surrender possession, they have trouble getting it back. We've seen at times the Ducks be – for half the overtime, two or three minutes, they're stuck in their own end because they can't get possession back, uh, and that costs them later on in, in overtime. And a lot of times they, they get scored on during that long bit of possession for the other team. Um, and then when they do have possession of the puck, like you said, they make poor decisions that lead to turnovers and in some cases lead to goals. You know, Getzlaff makes a drop pass, a, a slap shot that shouldn't be taken, uh, you know, trying to be too risky on a pass. You just got to be simple in overtime. I mean, it's three on three, hold possession, you know, wait for the right opportunity and make them pay. And that's something the Ducks haven't been able to do so far. Yeah, I, exactly. You hit the nail on the head. And, uh, you know, another big thing, like you mentioned, too, is, uh, you know, division games. You want to win those in regulation, four point game. You know, you lose this one in overtime, you get a point, but they get two. So that's huge. And, you know, the Ducks had two more division games right after this. They um, went to Canada, they played the Flames, and then they played Vancouver. Again, you know, big four-point games. Um, they went into the one uh, against Calgary. If you remember the last game, you know, the Ducks got smoked, you know, 8-3. to three. Um, So I'm not going to lie, I was a little nervous about this game to see how it was going to go. And, uh, you know, the Ducks got scored on. Uh, right away in the first period so it was one nothing flames but um the ducks answered in this game and, and you know after that goal eddie uh the ducks really played a good defensive game against calgary they only gave up that one goal they you know got three unanswered goals and they ended up uh, you know avenging that loss and winning this game three to one yeah and they really used special teams to their advantage in this game you know if calgary did have four power play opportunities they didn't score on any of them and, and you know the the Flames took a lot of penalties this game. You know, the Ducks had six power play opportunities and they scored on two of them. And that was really the big difference maker in this game. They ended up winning three to one and, and two of the goals were on the power play, the the game tire and the game winner. So, uh, you know, a, a big comeback game after the, the loss against the, the Sharks in overtime. Um, you know, the, the Flames are right behind them in the standings. So it's a big, a big game to win, especially in, in regulation. You know, uh, like, uh, like I said, the special teams were good. Gibson had a strong game as well. And I think it was an all, all in all a nice uh, rebound game after you know a harsh loss in overtime. Yeah, and we also finally got to see Brandon Montour. You know, he was called up. Uh, Sammy Botnin was dealing with the flu, so he came in and played. He actually uh, Montour had almost 18 minutes, just uh, you know 17:54. He played total um, power play. He was on there almost four minutes. Uh, you know, he didn't have any points in this game, but, you know, I, I liked what I saw. I mean, it's what I expected. He, he would fire the puck when he was at the point. Good two-way game. Uh, he was making some smart plays there, if you watched. Uh, little times where he'd let a puck go by to get to another player, or he'd be in a you know, good position. And I thought he did a really good job in his first game, Eddie, in his uh, NHL debut. Yeah, he looked like he belonged there. I, I mean, he didn't make any too obvious mistakes. You know, I think... When you don't notice a guy, especially in his first NHL game, and, and he's a defenseman. I mean, for Montour, he's more of a flashy offensive guy, but he he played really good, you know, solid defensive game in this. And and at times we did notice him, and usually that's a good thing because he's not making mistakes. And uh, obviously he he showed uh, Carlisle that he belonged out there. He played, you know, like you said, almost 18 minutes in this game, which is uh was second lowest, but it's just behind Josh Manson and, and Kevin Bieksa. So. A good solid first game from him. Obviously, no points, but you know, though, come he he has the skill offensively. He just has to adjust to the NHL game. You know, and then uh, he got to play again. Uh, you know, the Ducks played Vancouver the very next night, um, and he came in. And uh, this game was a little interesting. The way that the lineup went out. A couple things happened before this game that were announced that were kind of different. Eddie, we saw Gibson come in and play again, which. You know, I mean, he he played well against Calgary, so I can kind of understand why that happened. But then the Ducks, 
you know, they kind of pulled the Tampa Bay Lightning here. They went with seven defensemen, 11 forwards, and you kind of wondered what was going to happen because you see some teams, they'll have seven defensemen, and one of those defensemen will play like maybe, you know, a fourth-line uh, winger-type role or whatnot. But in this game, it was a little bit different. Uh, Carlisle double-shifted uh, Getzloff, Raquel, and Kessler. At least those were the three I saw the most that were also going on the fourth line. So I thought it was a little interesting, and it seemed to be okay this game. But, you know, the Ducks battled it out. You know, they, they, they got the 2 nothing lead uh, in the second period, but then kind of went to sleep a little bit after that. Ended up going into overtime. We all know what happens about overtime, so they ended up losing there. But what did you think about the lineup and, you know, Gibson going back-to-back and, and whatnot? I think it was interesting. I, I mean, I expected Bernier to go. Um, I think, you know, it's a little bit of a vote of confidence for, for Gibson. Uh, when we get into the Philadelphia game too, he's played now three three games in four nights. So I think they're they're kind of showing that they want him to be the number one, and, and they have confidence in him to to play in those types of scenarios. Um, but you no, know, I think what was disappointing in, in this game and what kind of cost them in the end is is they couldn't stay out of the penalty box. I mean, you know, the, the Canucks only scored on one of their seven power play opportunities, but you know, for 14 minutes of the game you're shorthanded and you're not going to get many scoring opportunities when you're shorthanded. So I think that kind of put them behind the ball during this game. Obviously they managed to scrape out a point. Um, but again, like we said, going to overtime, uh, the ducks just can't figure it out this season, but you know, having seven defensemen is a little bit interesting. We saw kind of that six, seven roll rotate between Holzer, Theodore and Montour this game. They all played about 10, 12, 13 minutes. So, the the big minutes went to Lindholm, Manson, BX, and Fowler, and then they went out there with eleven forwards to rotate the lines a bit, and it was something we hadn't seen. Um, you know, I can't say it worked fully to effect in this game. I, I mean, it, it wasn't a, a you know a revelation uh, to to right. you know playing with twelve and six, but no, just to shake things up, I think playing a back to back give uh, the defense a little bit more rest. You know, how you have seven guys out there, you can rest guys a little bit more, even though. I mean, Fowler still played 25 minutes in this game, but uh, I think it's just to give the bottom pairing guys a little bit of rest and mix things up. Yeah, I agree. I think that's why they went with that. Um, you know, I'd like to see if they do try it again, if they, you know, maybe put, you know, one of the forward spots as a defenseman. It'd be kind of interesting to see. But I don't know if we'll see that again. We, we'll, we'll talk about it, though. We definitely have a fan question, so we'll go into it a little bit more uh, later in the show. Uh, I also thought it was interesting Carlisle's comments about the penalties. Um, when he was asked, you know, after the uh, the game was over, he said he didn't want to say anything that would get him uh, fined. So that kind of tells you how he felt. And not to blame, you know, a, a loss on penalties. We're, you know, we're not big fans of that, uh, uh, you know, trying to, you know, make excuses and whatnot. But I did think the disparity was a little crazy, Eddie, because, you know, the Ducks had got out to that lead. And then, you know, you're killing these penalties, like you said, you know, almost a period. You have 14 minutes. I I just thought it was, you know, especially that one with Cogliano towards the end of the third. I, I just thought that one was super iffy um, and unfortunate. But, I mean, it is what it is. Uh, the Ducks did get a point out of it. You know, it, it just it, it, it hurts like we you and I have talked about when you're playing a division team and you go to overtime. Even if you win, you win, but you gain one point. Here you lose, you lose one point. So it's it's another four-point game that we saw, uh, just like with the Shark game, Eddie, where the Ducks come up short in overtime. Yeah, I think it was just a lack of consistency. I mean, if you're going to call something, like you mentioned with the Cogliano penalty, you're telling me that you know Vancouver only did something wrong once in a game. If you if that's the, you know, the, the line that you're drawing for penalties, that's what was kind of disappointing in this game. You know, um, I think that the, the Canucks could have deserved a couple more penalties. Not that it would have helped the game. Um, you know, and, and it's not like it hurt the Ducks either uh, on the score sheet. You know, Vancouver only did score on one of their power plays, but the fact that it takes up so much time in the game, you're shorthanded, you don't get a, a lot of opportunities in the offensive zone, you know, that does have an impact on the outcome of the game. And, and, and not to say they lost because of the refs, but it, it sure doesn't help when, when you, you know, you're sitting in the box for 14 minutes and, and the other team, you know, you only get one power play on the other side. Yeah, it definitely took the ducks out of their rhythm, I think. And, and it, you know, had them, you know, running around and getting tired too. So, um, you know, it's a little disappointing, you know, like we said, the season's been kind of a roller coaster. So, you know, one game, they'll win the next game, they'll lose. And, and if you want to talk about, a roller coaster within a game 
we should really look at this Philadelphia game. This is probably one of the wildest games, Eddie, that I have attended, uh, you know, regular season wise for the Ducks in a while. I mean, this game against Philly pretty much had everything in it. Uh, you know, from the moment you show up, if you showed up early or if, if you didn't go to the game, you didn't have a chance to see it. But you go there and Tamu's on the Zamboni going around, you know, the ice in the beginning, which is just sitting there laughing because it's just funny. He's on there with his big smile and everything. And then when the game gets underway, you have uh, Bieksa and Simmons go at it right away in the beginning. Uh, and, and what you don't see this often, I've only seen it a couple of times, that is you see <laughs> Bieksa just rip off everything off Simmons, his, his, his chest pad, everything. He's just totally, you know, from the waist up, nothing. And they're going at it. And, of course, the refs stop it once all the gear went flying. Um I mean, there's just so much in this game. You have Kessler gets a, a hat trick, a natural hat trick. Um, you know, the Ducks look good in this game in the beginning. They're up uh, three to one early in the second period. Um, then all hell breaks loose in this game. Uh, Philly goes crazy. You know, they get 55 shots in this game, which is just ridiculous. Uh, you see Gibson get pulled for a second. He comes back in. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this was just a crazy game. It had everything in it, Eddie, and they went to overtime. Uh, they survived the overtime. They uh, went to the shootout, won in the shootout. Uh, I don't know what, where you want to start, but there's so much we can cover in this game. It's definitely an exciting one and, and one that the Ducks got fortunate to get two points out of. Yeah, it's one of the craziest se- uh, you know, games of the, the whole season, and what a way to, to start you know, the new year for the Ducks and to scrape out a win like this. Obviously, you don't want to have to win games like this. I, you know, I don't remember the last time that the Ducks allowed 50 shots or more, and, and I mean, through three periods in overtime they allowed 55 shots on goal and, and Gibson was outstanding in this game I mean he he stopped 51 and Bernier came in for that that one <laughs> shot that he saved uh, during the second period there but uh and, and then Kessel like you said getting the hat trick and and you know really solidifying him uh, as the Ducks best player this season by far I mean he's leading the team in, in points he's one behind Raquel in goals um you know, defensively, he's one of the best players in the duck. Just a a great game for him this this uh, against the Flyers. But really, it was it was him and Gibby that were keeping the Ducks in this. And not not that everybody else played bad. It's just there wasn't much offense coming from from the other players, and, and there was a lot of defensive mistakes that led to the Flyers being able to score uh, to have fifty five shots on goal. And, and you know, sometimes when you look at this, you say, oh yeah, a lot of the shots came from outside. But if if you look at the scoring chances in this game. You know, a majority of the Flyers' scoring chances came from within the the slot and right in front of the net. So, you know, kudos to to Gibson in this game for playing outstanding and being able to scrape out a win and, and making that ridiculous save on Voracek as well in the shootout to to extend it for them. Yeah, I mean, it was just a crazy. Everything was crazy in this game. We saw uh, Ryan Getzloff left the game late in the game. He had a lower body injury. There's no other update on that, but he was out. So he wasn't out there uh, for the overtime, which you and I have talked about this. I'm not a fan of pairing gets off in a three on three. I, I don't. I think that they hurt more than help. That's just my take on it. I, I just not a big fan of them out there. So I, I really thought the Ducks were going to win, especially you know you had Raquel. He had that breakaway from center ice in the overtime, but he got stopped by Mason. That was a crazy moment. You also had uh, Gibson when he left. You know I, I sit in the 400 section behind the benches, and when he came off the ice he went in the tunnel was just livid and he was you know yelling at carlisle and then that was kind of a weird moment too eddie because they said after the fact that carlisle had this plan to pull him out then put him back in during the tv timeout so he didn't burn you know his regular timeout i i just thought that was interesting what did you think about that that strategy there yeah i don't know i mean it's hard to say if that was actually his strategy at the beginning of the game i don't see why that would make any sense for him to have that strategy to start the game i don't know why you'd ever want to pull your goalie out of the game just to bring him back in i mean Bernie only played three minutes and 48 seconds in this game, and then they decided to put to put Gibby back in. Uh, I mean, it worked because he came back in and he <laughs> stopped every single shot after that. But it's just an odd thing to to see. You don't see it happen often. So it, you know, I I feel like it was a more of an in game decision. I don't know if he is actually you know the truth behind the fact that he thought it up before the game started. Um, but yeah, it's it's just a weird situation. Like I said, you don't see it happen often. Uh, you know, Gibby was playing an okay game. Like the the goals, you can you can't really say were his fault. 
uh, the first three goals of the game. That you know he made a really good save on on Travis Konechny, but the rebound ended up getting uh, po- poked into the back of the net. On Sean Couturier's goal, he tried everything he could, and then obviously Shen on, on the power play. But you know I, it worked, so I'm not going to criticize it. But it, it is a it is a weird decision that you don't see that often. Yeah, I think the one thing to take away from it, regardless if he made that decision right then or, or however it came about, is you know basically Gibson was fired up and and there's reports out there that he said, you know what, I'm going back in. I you know regardless. So in that regard, I kind of like that because you go out there, like you said, he you know the first you know, 20 plus minutes or so he didn't play, you know, poorly, but he didn't play great kind of average, you know, he gave up those three goals. Obviously the defense, which I kept telling people is, was terrible this game as well. Uh, if you give up 50 plus shots, your, your defense is doing something wrong. I'm sorry. And it's ridiculous. But anyways, he decides to, you know, get that fire and come back. And then, like you said, nothing gets by him except for, you know, one shot in the shootout. I mean, you gotta like that. You gotta like that he's he played these last three games in a row. He comes out and and battles it out, um, and I think that's a very good sign for him and, and for the people that are critics of Gibson. That if you can go out there and and play average, get pissed off at yourself, and then come back and and just go bonkers. I mean, he went nuts the rest of this game. He bailed out the Ducks so many times uh, at the end of the second period and then throughout the third, and then uh, to have over fifty saves. On your 50th NHL win, too. I mean, that's just crazy, Eddie. It's just a crazy game, crazy storylines in this one. Yeah, and he's been really good in his last three games. I mean, the Vancouver game wasn't as great, but it's hard to be good and to have good numbers in a back-to-back. I mean, you're already playing. You know, most of the team is tired. You're probably tired because you're playing. I mean, he's playing a game, second game in two nights. So it's hard to be good in that game, but in the Calgary game, he was great, only letting one goal, stopped over 30 shots. In this one, it was probably his best game of the season. He stopped 51 shots. I mean, he looks to be getting on a roll here, and, and, and hopefully he can continue it. I'm sure he'll probably start Wednesday against Detroit, and hopefully he can continue this good play uh, into that game and, and throughout the rest of the month. Yeah, the Ducks, you know, we talk about uh, the schedule, and obviously December was a crazy month where they only had four home games. Uh, and this is kind of one of the fan questions, but we'll, we'll talk about it too now. I mean, you look at January, it's the opposite. Now every single game is at home. They've only got four games on the road. So here's a chance, uh, you know, for the Ducks, especially with the lineup deal. You know, we did, um, forgot to mention these last couple of games too, um, Getzloff and Perry have been split up too. And that seemed to work a little bit better to the Ducks' favor, especially in these home games, Eddie, because as the Ducks – Go into the rest of January here. We've got Detroit, you know, who's obviously played them tough. Arizona, who's not done as well, but tends to always have, you know, uh, motivation against the Ducks. And then, of course, you've got Minnesota, who who was on that crazy win streak, which they they played uh, Columbus, who's got you know the record right now. Uh, it just they both those two teams have been playing phenomenal. So I, I think it's going to be a huge uh, thing for the Ducks to look towards the lineup matchups because um, you know hopefully Granite. Uh, Getzloff comes back. We we don't know as far as what happened, uh, you know, after this Philly game. There hasn't been an update. But if he's able to come back and the Ducks have those lines split up, it, it's much more difficult for the opposing teams, Eddie, because the Ducks now have three lines that they have to, you know, try and worry about. They can't just try and shut down Getzloff and Perry, and then oh, they've got the Kessler line. Um, so I think it's a big benefit for the Ducks as as we go into these next uh, games this week. Yeah, and I think realistically, I mean, Minnesota is still going to be a tough team to play. Yes, they lost, but they lost against the team who has a 15-game win streak right now. So they're still <laughs> going to be probably the hardest game of the week. Uh, Detroit coming off the loss in, in the Centennial Classic to uh, to Toronto, and then, and they're still they're still a tough team. Like you said, they they play the Ducks tough. They're obviously not as good this season, and, and really the last time we played them was just a, a poor game overall from the Ducks. Uh, so they'll be looking for a revenge there. And then, the, you know, you should win against the Coyotes. And, and not that any game in the NHL is easy, but, you know, they're one of the worst teams in the league right now. Uh, they let in a lot of goals. Mike Smith has, has bailed them out countless times in some games this season, making over 40 to 50 saves in, in some of the games that he's played in lately. So, and, you know, it'll be a tough game. It'll be a tough week. But I, I think realistically they should be able to, to scrape out two wins probably against Detroit and Arizona. And, and I think they'll play a tough game against Minnesota. And it's always nice to play, you know, especially when you're playing a tough team like that, to play it in your home building. It's always, it's always uh, you know, bodes well. 
Yeah, I agree with you. I, I think, you know, being at home this month is definitely going to help the Ducks, especially against some of these opponents. And, yeah, I would look for them to take, uh, you know, two out of three uh, at least this upcoming week. Um, you know, with that, we've got tons of questions, obviously, with all the stuff going on uh, with the Ducks. You know, we just saw Theodore uh, go down. Montour stayed up with the team. Uh, you know, obviously, Getzloff and Perry being split up and then Getzloff getting injured and all these different things. Um, so we're going to go over a bunch of fan questions um that everybody has uh the first one we've got here uh, we've got a couple about uh, ricard raquel but daniel asks about raquel uh, whether he's the ducks uh you know best offensive player uh, especially in light of how perry and gets off have you know struggled to score goals uh and with this one eddie uh, i would say i mean obviously he's scoring the most most goals at 16 so i would say yes but I would also throw Kessler in there, too. I mean, even before Kessler had the hat trick, he, he's been up there, too, really uh, taking it. So, to me, uh, I would go with Raquel and Kessler right now as the two best offensive weapons for the Ducks. Yeah, it's hard to, to kind of split them up. I mean, and Kessler's been so good. and He's got 15 power play points, which leads the team leads the team in regular points in 34, you know, second in goals. Uh, it's hard to put anybody, you know, higher than him. But Raquel, since coming back, has been great as well. He's got 23 points in 28 games, and he's leading the team in goals. His shooting percentage is over 20%. You know, still he does have uh, seven power play points too, as well. So, uh, I mean, it's hard to split them up. I think he's probably Anaheim's most creative forward. And if you're gonna, you know, say for offense, if it comes down to creativity, then yeah, I think he's their best offensive forward. But the way Kessler's been playing, and especially last night getting the hat trick, I think it's hard to put anybody higher than him right now. Yeah, and like we said, it, it's good to have them both, and then you have them both on separate lines, and you know it's making the matchups a little bit more difficult for the other teams. So definitely, uh, you know, I also uh, the price that we got Raquel is definitely a good deal. So I would look for Raquel to just continue to roll, um, and that that brings us to another question. Um, uh, Matt asks about uh, Raquel and he says, you know, that a lot of people underplay his performance, uh, say that he's going to play great, that he may cool off later on. And, you know, some people don't take him as seriously and, you know, kind of what our thoughts are about that. And, you know, Eddie, I, I, I don't really see Raquel slowing down. I mean, we've seen him on different lines too. We've seen him with Perry and Getzloff. We've seen him, uh, you know, with Vermint. We've seen him kind of been shifted around. I don't really think it matters where he plays or what he does, and I, I don't see Raquel slowing down. Yeah, I, I mean, he slowed down from when he first came back where he was almost scoring or getting a point every game. I mean, didn't get a point against Ottawa or San Jose or last night, but you know, he's not going to get a point every night. You know, He did have a goal against Calgary and against Vancouver, and I think that's the type of production we're going to get from the rest of the season. I, I, I think he can put up you know 30 goals 40 50 60 points if he plays a full season you know i i don't see him slowing down he's only getting better he you know he's he's playing uh, on a big line for the ducks for most of the season with getzlaff and, and perry obviously that's been split up right now but you know he's going to get his opportunities and, he, and he's making good on his chances so i i definitely think he's undervalued or underrated right now in, in the league um, you know, this is his breakout season essentially. So I, I can understand people saying he will slow down, but at one point, you know, he's going to become an elite player for the ducks. And, you know, I, I see it being this season, if he can continue playing the way he is. I absolutely agree. I mean, he's just been outstanding and, and yeah, like you said, he's, he's slowing down the sense of not getting a point every game, but let's be realistic. He's doing awesome no matter where he is in the lineup. Uh, you know, we have another question um, towards the lineup. Uh, Chad asks about the Ducks when they went with the seven defensemen and whether or not we thought it was useful or if it was hurtful. Should they do it more often? I, I kind of have mixed feelings on this, Eddie. I, I, I like it uh, maybe in that back-to-back -back scenario. Uh, I don't know if I necessarily agree, though, with double shifting forwards all the time. I, I kind of rather see maybe one of the defensemen play a forward role. I mean... I know that's difficult, too, because they're used to playing defense. But, you know, um, it's kind of funny because you and I had talked about this back at the beginning of the season um, when the Ducks had lost all the forwards. They had re-signed Botnin and, and Lindholm came in. And we had talked about whether the Ducks would do this or not, and they, they finally did it for one game. Um, I like it in certain scenarios. That's that's kind of the way I look at it, Eddie. What's your take on it? Yeah, I, th I think it makes sense in a back-to-back, -back, um, especially if you played a tough game the night before, to give some guys a rest. 
Um, cause you can only, you can like double, you can, sh instead of giving a guy like Theodore or, or Holzer 20, you know, 18 to 20 minutes a night after they played a game, you can plug a guy like Montour and like they did and, and play them only 10 minutes or 12 minutes and, and have a little bit more rest throughout the game. So I think it makes sense in a situation like that, but to, you know, to put yourself a forward down in, in games where you should be rested, where you have a day's rest, I, I don't think it, it makes sense. You know, then you're double shifting, like you said, most likely double shifting Kessler or Getzlaff or Perry. So I think, I think like it makes sense in certain situations more, more often than not, it's going to be in a back to back. I don't really see any other situation where it makes sense. Maybe if a guy's tired or something like that, but I don't think we'll see it too often this season. I, I don't think it makes a huge difference on their performance other than just giving some guys uh, some needed rest. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I don't think it makes that big of an impact. And, I mean, obviously in that game against Vancouver, they they lost anyways. I mean, they started out good, but, you know, they, they didn't pull it out in overtime. So um, I don't think we'll see it too much more, you know, uh, as the season progresses. Um Another question we had is uh, Danny asks about Gibson. You know, you and I talked about this and how he played the last several games in a row. He um, talks about how he was spectacular uh, against Philly. Uh, would you consider him number one? I mean, you and I pretty much do consider him number one. Um, and, you know, him also just talking about playing all these games and whatnot. Um, and just what we think overall as far as Gibson, as far as how he's doing and how he's progressing as being number one. And I think he's doing well. I mean, we talked about it. Uh, you know, he went in the back to back scenarios, which is what your number one goalie, if you want him to be the guy, he needs to do that. Uh, you know, obviously, he won one and lost one. Um, you have the Philly game, like I had talked about earlier, him getting, you know, just irritated and then coming back out and just playing out of his mind. So, the way I see it, uh, yeah, I mean, he's, he's the guy. You and I have said he's the guy. And uh, I, I think the Ducks are going to probably lean on him a little bit more, Eddie, because that's kind of been what's happened, you know, towards the end of December here. Yeah, and if you look at the schedule this month, they've got no back to backs in every day, for every game up until the Oilers game. And I believe that we were mentioned talking about it before the podcast. I believe that marks the end of the the game. And then it's the All Star game, and then they play the the Avalanche on the thirty first. I'm not exactly sure again when the All Star game is, but I'm pretty sure it's at the end of January. But anyway, they've they've got a day's rest between each game up until then. So we could see him a lot this month. I mean. Realistically, if he plays great, you can see him for the, you know, for the majority of these games. I'm not going to say all of them, because rarely. I mean, he's eventually going to get tired even with the day's rest. So we'll probably see Bernie for a couple of them. But you no, know, if he continues his play, uh, he's going to play the majority of games this month, and, and I think he deserves it. I, I mean, it's good that they're showing confidence in him, and I think it's a big thing for a goaltender. And, and you know, like Danny mentioned, you know, it, you, it's good to know that the coach has your back and that they're, that they're confident in putting you in the net in those situations. And you know, he's shown it in, in the game against Calgary and the game last night that he's ready to go. Um, I, I mean, we would all expect him to get the the start in Detroit especially with two days of rest. And if he continues his play from, from there and plays well in that game, I mean, he could play Arizona, he could play Minnesota, he could play Dallas. I mean, he could play for a, lo a lot of games in a row after that. You know, you never know. Yeah, I, I agree. I think you're going to be seeing a lot of them in the month of January, just like you talked about for sure. And, and yeah, Bernier's going to be in there. He's still going to get his chances as well. But look for Gibson to be leaned on, uh, I think, a ton. I just hope that the, the defense shows up better than that <laughs> Philly game. Oh, my God, the defense was nowhere to be found. Um, it just wasn't in that game. So, um, you know, with that, kind of goes into another, another question here by uh, Daniel. He asks about who would our midseason award winners be right now, you know, talking about – um, different players. I mean, we talked about Raquel and Kessler, obviously, on offense. Um, talked about Gibson's play. I mean, I think all of those three names are ones that you would agree with. You know, another name that we didn't really talk about on the show, Eddie, is uh, you got to talk about Cam Fowler. Uh, you know, you want to talk about another guy with a, you know, mental fortitude. You know, he's the topic of the trade rumors. You remember we talked about this over the summer. He was on vacation in Hawaii. He gets called by LeBrun from ESPN while he's out there about trade rumors. I mean, the poor guy, you know, can't even rest over the summer or enjoy any of his off time. And he comes out and, you know, really surprised, I think, everybody, us included. I mean, we all thought the Ducks were going to re-sign Vatanen and Lindholm, and those were going to be the guys. But I would have to give huge kudos to Fowler uh, so far on this point in the season, Eddie. Yeah, and, and he finally looks like the defenseman that you know we've expected to see. 
Um, you know, he's he's on pace to to do better than last year. Probably uh, have a, a close to the season that he had when he had 40 points in, in 2010, 2011. Um, you know, he should reach that. Uh, you know, it's 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 going to be close. I mean, through 39 games, he has 22 points, so he's looking at around you know 40 to 50 points this season, which will be great for him. Most likely, will hit a career high in goals. He's at nine. Obviously, the the career high for him is 10. And he's been great this season on the power play. He's he's been great. You know, three of his nine goals are game winning goals. So he's he's had big impactful goals as well. So I I think it will be uh you know it will be interesting to see if he can continue it up for the rest of the season. And I think he can. I mean, he's showing that he's ready to shoulder the load for the Ducks. I mean, he played twenty five minutes almost every night. You know, you look at the best NHL in the league; they're playing twenty four, twenty five, twenty six minutes a night, and he's showing that he can do that and be an impactful player at the same time. So I think it's a big season for him, and and I hope that he can continue playing the way that he that he is right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, he's been carrying it right now, uh, you know, in terms of playing, you know, two way. And like you said, what we've expected to see from him, it's just been awesome uh, this season. You know, a, a couple other players, maybe kind of runner up, up players, maybe not war types, but some of the younger guys that I kind of look to that have been surprises, maybe to some and not to others, though. Eddie's been Casse and Camarosa. I mean, you got to like the way both of these guys play. Um, they both have a couple of goals, uh, you know, four or five assists. And they're both added to the Ducks lineup. Kase is getting all these scoring chances. Um, you know, he's been doing pretty well in the shootouts. You have Cam Rosa, who's come up and basically just demolished everybody in every fight that he's gotten into. I mean, it's just been crazy, which is if you follow him at the goals, you knew that that's how he is. I mean, that's his style of game. Um, so, you know, obviously the Ducks have leaned a little bit on the goals this year. We've, we've talked about that before on the show. But I'd give both these guys a huge thumbs up too, Eddie, just for the energy that they have brought into the lineup. Yeah, I mean the impact that they've had is definitely not nothing that we expected. Uh, you know, even points wise, Casse has seven and twenty three, and, and Cramarosa has six and, and twenty seven. Those aren't amazing numbers by any standards, but they're more than we expected for for these guys, especially when they came came up. And you know, it, it's great to have these guys in, in your bottom six that that can play. You know, they're energy guys, like you said. They they uh, they don't always get on the score sheet, but they get on it enough to to make an impact. And, and I think you know with especially with Cassie and his speed and creativity and Cremorosa with his grit. And I mean, he, like you said, he kills everybody he gets in a fight with. So that always energizes the team too. So I think it's, it's been a big season for those two. And I think another guy too, you have to give some credit to is Nick Ritchie. He really has stepped up this mm-hmm. season. He only does have 13 points, but he, he, you know, he hits everything that moves. He makes it difficult for the other team to, to, to play, especially when he, when he's been playing with Getzlaff and Perry this season. And I think he's been really good this season. He's made he made a step forward. Um, you know, eight goals is is good enough uh, for you know close to what Coglano and Fowler are at this season. So hopefully he can take a step forward this year and continue playing well. Yeah, I agree with you on Richie. You know, he's like you said, he's got eight goals. It's more than Perry. <laughs> you know, if we want to talk about, you know, and I know how some of the people are in my section. I got some pretty rowdy fans in this new section I sit in. It's pretty hilarious to hear uh, some of the chirps and stuff uh, and some of the <laughs> some of the players. But um, yeah, you know, uh, Richie with uh, you know eight goals is, is obviously improved too. So definitely, you know, some of the younger guys coming up and helping out this team. Uh, has definitely been key, and that that kind of goes into uh, several questions we have about you know the new year, and uh, uh, we have Eddie Richard asks about you know what what's our resolutions for the Ducks in the new year. Um, we've also got uh, George asks about what are some of the changes that the Ducks can make. Uh, Lauren also asks about some of their strengths and weaknesses. So it's kinda, these these three questions kind of all go together, Eddie. Uh, we can kind of talk about them. I, I think the biggest thing that we've talked about is, is really just when the ducks play certain games, it's just, it seems like the defense has been to me has been the biggest issue. It's, it's not been so much the offense. The offense has been scoring. Uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to get to that third goal and, you know, the ducks have been remarkable when they score three goals, but, um, it, to me, it, it's been kind of a weird season. We didn't expect this. We thought maybe the offense would have trouble like last season and not score as much. But to me, it's it's been the defensive struggles and trying to figure out, uh, you know, what's going on. Uh, because like we said, Fowler's come up and stepped up, but Votnin and Lindholm haven't really played as well as we expected. They're not playing terrible, but they're just not playing as well. So for me, uh, a big 
thing as we go forward here is the way the Ducks play defense. Um, you know, a lot of people look at the goalie situation too, but um, I, I don't really think the goalie thing is an issue. I, to me, I, I look more towards how the Ducks play team defense. Um, and another issue we'll get into also is uh, overtime play as well. Yeah, I think we're they're kind of right around where we thought they were going to be in goal scoring this year. Um, you know, they're sitting 15th in the league right now. I, I don't think we expected them to be a top 10 uh, team this year. Uh, I mean, Kessler has been more than we expected. Raquel's been more than we expected. Silverberg's been great. You know, disappointing, I guess, for Perry that he only has seven goals. But, you know, everybody has pretty much been at or better than we expected offense-wise. You know, Vermette, again, has 16 points. I, I don't know if we expected that much offense out of him either. So it, it's been great in, in that aspect and guys stepping up. I think it's been disappointing, again, like I said, in Perry and the amount of goals that he scored. And maybe even Getzlaff. Getzlaff does have 30 points, but I expected him to, to hopefully shoot the puck a little bit more this season, and it's been a little bit disappointing in that aspect. But, yeah, it, it does come down to defense because of how good they were last year. Uh, the same the same team is there this year. The you know, same guys on defense are there this year, and, and for some reason you know they just can't get it going defensively. So... I think that's a big issue. You know, they are sitting 18th in the league, which you know, at 2.77 goals against per game, so that is pretty disappointing. We expected them to be on the lower, you know, 2.4, 2.3 at least. So, I think that's something. Hopefully, they can work on and and get better at during the uh, the new year. And and I think uh, if they can get it during this month, it, it will definitely translate into some more wins. You know, and part of that equation too, Eddie, might be Brandon Montour. I mean, we saw Theodore went down this past week. They kept Montour up. I'm kind of curious to see what's going to happen. I mean, also, uh, obviously, with the trade situation, which we have a question about that. We'll get to that in a minute. But I think he could make a little bit uh, of an impact there, too. You know, Or, uh, as we talked about, too, if the Ducks do decide to try to go with uh, seven defensemen again, maybe in the back-to-back scenario, maybe that'll help a little bit. Uh, those are just some things maybe uh, you know to keep an eye on as uh, we roll through the month of January. Yeah, like he's been good defensively. So if he can continue playing well, they're obviously having, uh, to, they're going to take a little bit more of a, a better look at him in the next few games, but, uh, which I think is big. I and mean, we talked about it the last podcast saying if he can play well and show that he belongs in the NHL, then, you know, it kind of makes a guy like Vaughton and, and maybe to an extent Fowler expendable because they can move that for a better, you know, asset on, on forward and, and it frees up some space. So I think, um, It'll be interesting to see how he plays in the next few games and how you know how long he stays up here if they're if they're going to look at him you know if he stays just for the Detroit game or if he plays well and they look at him through you know Arizona and then Minnesota and then maybe even Dallas just to see how how long they decide to keep him up here and, and how you know how well he gels with this team um, and I think right now Vaughn is probably the most expendable just because Montour is a similar player right-handed shot you know can quarterback the power play and, and it'll be interesting to see. If they decide to go that route, especially with just signing Vaughn into a new contract this season. Yeah, and I think we mentioned that last time in the podcast. And, and when uh, you know the trade deadline comes up, that's something I'd keep an eye on. Because if you trade Vaughn in, uh, you bring Montour up, I mean, you're going to kind of help the cap situation. You still have got the defense with Brandon coming up there. Uh, it can kind of work out. So, I mean, it's going to be interesting with the month of you know January. Then obviously the trade deadline comes in February towards the end of the month there. So that's something I would look at is the Ducks defense and how they play in these next two months is going to be key. Uh, I think another thing, uh, this isn't big for the playoffs because obviously in the playoffs they don't have three-on-three overtime. But the Ducks have just been terrible in this three-on-three overtime. And it's not a big deal, I guess, Eddie, when you're playing three on three and you're playing an, um, an East Coast team and, and it's not, you know, like uh, Philly. It's not a, as big of a deal. But like we talked about, it can come back to bite the Ducks against division opponents, especially because the way the Pacific is shaping up right now, it, it, I mean, it could be five teams. Uh, it could be uh, four for sure, most likely five. Um, I just don't want to see the Ducks get stuck in this rut of overtime losses and then they end up in a wild card spot instead of being, you know, one, two or three. Um, you know, I don't care about the Pacific Division. I don't think any of you out there could, you know, care because we know what's happened the last four seasons with that. But you definitely want to be in the top of the division and not be forced in a wild card spot, you know, and, the, and these overtime losses are starting to mount up. Yeah, and, and it's lost points. I mean, they're at eight overtime shootout losses this season. Um, you know, those are eight points that you could possibly have. They're only one point behind San Jose right now. 
Um, you know, you have four of those points. You're sitting at 50 points. You're three games up, or sorry, three points up on the Sharks, and they with, with two games in hand for them. So you're in a better position at, at that point if you can, you know, pull out a win in those uh, in those tight games. And and it's just an ugly record. I mean, if they were three and four, or you know, even two and five, you'd be like, okay, it's not too bad. But I, you said right. I believe it was like zero oh and seven right now that they are yeah. in, in overtime right now. Which is just terrible, and, and this is a team you would expect to be pretty good. They've got some mobile defensemen in Fowler and Vatnin and, and Theodore and Montour, uh, with some quicker forwards in Raquel, Cogliano, Silverberg. You've got Kessler out there as well. You obviously get Slav and Perry, who haven't been good in overtime, but you would normally expect you know, you know your best players to be good in three on three overtime, and, and it just hasn't clicked. You know they've had their chances, and they just haven't been able to finish anything, and it, and it just looks bad. Like zero and seven is is you you something you have to work on now. When it gets to that point, you've got to figure out a new strategy and, and how you're going to go about it. Because if you continue to blow points like that in overtime, I don't think it's going to affect their chances to make the playoffs. But I mean, it affects your standing and, and it changes who you're going to end up playing in, in the first round. And, and that could be you know the key to either losing in the first round or, or moving on and, and winning the Stanley Cup. Yeah, that that's my concern. It is it's not so much just the play in it of itself, but it's the impact as far as the standings. Like you, you reiterated too, and uh, it's interesting what they've done too. Is um, we have a uh, you know Chad asked another question about the shootouts and and Perry being out there on the shootouts. Well, what's funny is Perry's not out there on the three on three. If you've noticed that, he hasn't been out there in the last couple of games, um, which I think is a good thing because I'm sorry, three on three, uh, Perry's defense is just not. It's not good uh, you know five on five is one thing but three on three is not a good a situation he did go out there on the shootout though last night and he got you know the winning shot there uh which was huge so you know uh chad asked why did they put him out there on the shootout honestly i think because perry is is you know he had that a couple weeks recently where he did really well now he's back in the slump mode to me putting him out there on the shootout eddie is, is maybe a tactic to get his confidence back because i mean he did great last night. It came out huge. I mean, I, I know that doesn't necessarily translate into four and four or five on five play, whatnot. But I would hope that maybe it'd give him a little bit of a jump, uh, you know, getting that goal in that shootout. Yeah, and, and you have to remember, still, he's still one of the best players uh, on the Ducks roster. I, I mean, they didn't. Th- it's not like they threw him out in, in the first three shooters and said, okay, yeah, you know, he's one of our go-to guys. You know, they threw him out. I believe it was fifth or sixth. So. I mean, when you get down to that point, he's going to be better than, you know, say, throwing out Vermette or throwing out uh, one of the fourth liners or, or anybody like that. So, I, I mean, him going at that point makes sense. And obviously, like you said, throwing him out there, maybe to give him a little bit of confidence so he can put the puck in the back of that and kind of hopefully remember that he can actually score goals at the NHL level. So hopefully that gives him a little bit of confidence. Obviously, it's not an actual goal, but, you know, it's still... Right, right. It still will hopefully give him a little bit of confidence and that he can break out of this slump, which is now his second second slump this season and, and it's getting to the point where it's almost going to be two double digit slumps for him which is a lot of the season to go without scoring goals so you know hopefully he can get going uh, we've seen this before with Perry where once he finally can score he can get going we said that last time and he looked like he was about to start scoring some more goals and then again now he's in this slump so uh, I mean hopefully for him he can get going and get at least 20 goals this season and you know and just help contribute to the Ducks offense in the second half yeah, and I think that's one other thing uh, that we kind of you and I talked about too is you know splitting him and Getzhoff up. You know he actually had some good opportunities uh, in those games against uh, Calgary and Vancouver uh, last night. You know he's had, he's had some chances. I mean obviously it hasn't translated to much on the scoreboard and whatnot. Like you said, a shootout goal you know isn't really a goal because it, it doesn't really count in, in terms of you know personal stats and whatnot. Um, but I think that's another thing the Ducks got to look at. I I, I like that. Carlisle did decide to change the lineup because while we've been on this, you know, win one, lose one kind of a path lately, he'd gone just with the same lineup basically uh, outside of the fourth line. You know, he'll change up the fourth line occasionally, but you know, the top three lines have been the same. So I like that he he split them up and moved them around. Um, you know, he's not changing the lines all crazily like Boudreaux did, and we could never figure out what the heck's going on. But at least he's going okay. I've tried this, you know, for two weeks, and it's not really working. So we got to change it up. So I do like the fact that Carlisle's doing that, and I do think uh, going into this second half of the season that having a more balanced attack and making the matchups a little bit more uh, difficult for opposing teams should help Anaheim. 
Yeah, and, and and we've mentioned this before, and we saw it last season. I mean, having center depth like that obviously helps, and you can spread the lineup out more. You've got even probably even more center depth than you did last year, having Getzlaff, Kessler, and Vermette now, and you know the Ducks being the best faceoff team in the league. You can you know split up guys. You can win more. Um, win more draws in the offensive zone and then when you have the lineup split up like that you have more offensive weapons to hurt teams so now with Vermette's line you've got Raquel and Perry on his line that's a that's a threat as well you've got the Kessel line that's always together and they've been the Ducks best line this season and then now you've got Getzlaff and he's with I believe it was was it I think it was Cache and, and Richie and, and you know that's going to be a threat too with with Getzlaff on that line, and especially how Richie and Kaché have played this season. And the fact that now you have three lines, it makes it difficult for teams to match up against you. You know Kessler is most likely going to match up against their best player, uh, and then you know they're going to have their shutdown line against either Vermette's line or Getzlaff's line. And then you've got that other line that is is pretty much a, a favorable matchup no matter who you match up against. You've got either Vermette's line against one of their weaker lines, or you've got uh, Getzlaff's line against one of their weaker lines. So it gives you an advantage when you can actually split up the line like that. So I think I think it'll be key to their success if they can, you know, if they can score goals and find success playing like that. I think it'll be, uh, you know, contribute to more wins in, in this second half of the season. Yeah, and you know, with that, uh, as far as the way the lineup is now. Uh, we have to look at you know making any changes. We kind of talked about this earlier as far as trades and whatnot. We have Andrew that asks us about uh, you know naming five teams or so that the Ducks could trade with. I don't know if there's five teams right now um, that we change it up. We did mention about the Ducks trying to trade maybe a defenseman and move things around that way to create more cap space and then obviously bring in another forward, which we kind of talked about that all season. Um, but what are some teams that uh, maybe – we should keep an eye on if there's not five, but at least a couple teams that may, maybe people out there are saying, Hey, you know, who should we watch in the next uh, two months, Eddie, in, in regards to the ducks and, you know, maybe making a trade. Colorado is still most likely the, you know, the most likely option for the ducks to trade with. They've been poor this season defensively, you know, 122 goals against it. It's worst in the Western conference. And, and you know, I think they're the most likely option. They got a lot of attractive offensive pieces that, that apparently they're willing to move in, in either Gabriel Landeskog or, or Matt Duchesne, even Jerome McGinley to some extent as well, even though his cap hit is, isn't the best situation for the Ducks to take on right now. But they're one that you would have to look at. They're looking for a defenseman, specifically a left shot defenseman, you know, which is something we probably wouldn't want to move either being Fowler or Theodore, but you know, when you have the possibility of bringing in a guy like Landis Cog or Duchesne, I mean, you're going to have to give something up good to, to get a guy like that in. Um, you know, for the Western Conference, there's not too many other, you know, teams that make sense right now. Maybe Arizona, because there was rumors that they were looking to move Anthony Duclair, but that again, that's moving in the Pacific Division, and it's not something that you would always likely, you know, to, to move a, a good player within teams like that. And then you go over to the Eastern Conference, and, and there's a couple more options. You know, there's still rumors with Toronto and, and, and JVR, but the fact that now they've won five in a row or, and are pushing for a playoff spot, that kind of pushes the likeliness down of, of him being moved. And then you've got um, Detroit again. You know, they're struggling still. You could uh, you know possibly see Tatar again being moved, maybe Nyquist, maybe Anthony Mantha. Uh, there's an option there, but other than that, no, it, it, it there's not many options available for the Ducks right now, and and maybe that will change going closer to the trade deadline. It usually does, but you know if you're gonna bring in a top six four, there, there's not a lot of options out there available. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think all the teams that you mentioned are the ones to look at right now, uh, unless something changes, uh, like you said, if a, a team falls farther out of the playoff spot or somebody gets injured, whatnot. Um, I don't, I don't know if the Ducks are going to do too much. I mean, I know it's Murray and you know, he'll, he'll do all kinds of stuff and we still got two months to go, but the ones that you mentioned are the ones that I would look at too. Um, we have time for one more question. This one's, this one's a good one. Um, Eddie, uh, it's kind of interesting one. Uh, you know how the NHL will have alumni games and whatnot. Um, Khalid asks, you know, if the Ducks had an alumni game, who would you put on the roster? And I think this is a good question. I mean, there's a lot of names that pop up. I'll throw out a couple and then and have you throw out some too. But uh, I think you and I agree that uh, Jaguar, uh, Tamu, and Korea would probably be you know three of the big ones that would be on there uh, uh, for sure to start. You know if they had an alumni type game, Eddie. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, those are the three lists. The three names to probably on everybody's list are, are Korea, Jaguar, 
and Timu we've talked about before on who are the guys that the Ducks uh, could you know retire numbers for. And obviously Timu is retired, but Korea and Jaguar are probably the next two guys. So those are the most likely guys to show up for, for a, a, an alumni game like that. You have to look at probably Steve Ruchin as well, possibly Scotty Niedemeyer. Um, you know, you could look at uh, Sammy Paulson as well. Uh, Guy Herrera, he could most likely go there as well. And, and there's a lot of options for the Ducks, and it'd be something cool to see. I mean, we haven't seen anything since the uh, the Stadium Series game against the Kings way back, I think it was three or four years ago now, that they uh, they played in that game. So it'll be interesting to see who they would bring out to that game. I mean, we mentioned a lot of names. George Peros is one that might, might go. <laughs> Zaku Kwebu. You know, we you look at the Leafs. Yeah. The Leafs... Um, and, and the the Red Wings one with the Leafs, you had a lot of players who played on the Leafs at some point in their career, but weren't necessarily Leafs, you know, all stars. You look at Lanny McDonald; he went to to the Leafs one, but he, you know he's more remembered for his time in Calgary. So you you could see some players as well that not necessarily played the majority of their career with the Ducks, but are remembered for what they did there. So you could look at Chris Pronger as well if he's mm-hmm. able to play. Peter Sikora maybe as well. So, I mean, there's a lot of guys out there that you, you could see that could possibly uh, play in the Ducks alumni game. Yeah, and that would be a fun event. Like you said, even if they had some people, you know, like Chris Pronger, you know, he's only on the Ducks for a couple seasons, you know, not that long. Obviously, been on other teams as well. Uh, that would be something interesting to see to have. You know, it just as a fun game to see uh, some of the greats, whether they've been on the Ducks for, you know, uh, 10 seasons or they've been on the Ducks for two seasons. That would be a good event. So that's a great question. And uh, definitely, uh, you know, like we said, the top three, uh, you know, you have to have Jaguar out there. You'd have to have uh, Tamu and Korea. Um, obviously, Guy, of course, being, you know, the, the main guy between the pipes early on and whatnot. And, and, you know, there's a lot of other players. I'm sure we didn't mention everybody. But uh, like I said, it would be a fun event. Um, you know, with that, we'll uh, kind of wrap up here. We got a couple other little updates. Uh, I guess we can talk about some of the prospects, Eddie. Uh, you know, you got the World Junior Championship going on. You got USA that's been rolling in there. You got uh, Terry's been playing on the team. Uh, wh- how have the Ducks uh, prospects been doing as far as uh, this competition's been going? Well, at the World Juniors, they've been all right. Finland as a whole have been pretty bad at the tournament. They're going into the relegation round and, and not and sitting at zero points right now, but. You know, only a couple players on their team have over one point, and they've just been relatively disappointing. So it's been a disappointing tournament for Naughton and Finland as a whole. Uh, for Sweden, they've won all four games that they've played. Uh, Larsen has played an okay you know, offensively. He's only got one assist, but he's played a, a pretty good uh, tournament so far for Sweden. And then I guess the one we didn't expect, I mean, we expected probably those two to do better than Troy Terry, but Troy Terry's come out and he's put up four points in four games for, for Team USA, which is good enough for a tie for third in team scoring only behind probably U- the U.S.'s best players in Clayton Keller and Colin White. So it's been a great tournament for him, something we probably didn't expect. Didn't expect him to make the uh, the roster to begin with and the fact that he's actually put up points in, in, in four games. So I think it's great for him uh, obviously the two ducks biggest prospects the ones that aren't at the tournament max jones he's still hurt for london right now and he's probably got about a week or two back before he's playing again in the ohl and then sam Steele's continued to score goals and get points for for regina in the whl he's sitting second now only behind teammate adam brooks with 62 points in 29 games so he's still playing well for uh for regina despite being left off uh, team canada for the world juniors yeah, Steele and Jones. I mean, even with the stuff that's been going on, you know, you know, with injuries and whatnot, they've just been tearing it up. Uh, so I can't wait. You know, I, obviously, it's not going to be right around the corner, but I mean, it, it won't be long before we see those two. Hopefully, uh, you know, uh, up with the big team. Um, so we'll keep our, your eyes on that. We'll post some updates as well. Um, one other big thing that happened. Uh, it will go from young players to, I guess, older players, or one of the oldest players, uh, Eddie. Uh, uh, Yarmir Yager, he ended up uh, passing Mark Messe this last, uh, you know, since our last show uh, over the holiday break here. He ended up as now the second leading scorer in the NHL with uh, 1,891 points, uh, which is great. And then it was it was funny. You and I were talking about this before the show. 
about obviously Wayne Gretzky being first. Um, but I didn't realize how far ahead he was. <laughs> so we looked at the points, and then you realize that uh, Yager will definitely be second, but uh, he's, he's not going to catch Wayne. I mean, Wayne's got 2,857. I just I couldn't believe it was that high. I knew it was up there, Eddie, but wow. <laughs> but great for Yager to you know get up there in second place uh, and, and to see him still going at the age that he's at. Yeah, and he's still putting up points. Uh, I mean, at a regular pace in, in the NHL, he's he's playing good again for for the Panthers this season, despite their struggles. You know, he he solidified his spot in second, and he'll most likely reach nineteen hundred points before the end of the season. He's only nine points away right now, so he'll probably hit that mark uh, before the end of the season. And, and it's just great for him. I mean, the fact, like you said, that he's still playing. Um, he's producing at, at uh, a high rate still in, in the NHL, and especially at his age, it's something you rarely ever see. I mean, we saw Chris Chelios play forever, it seemed, with, with the Red Wings. And, and, and so, I mean, for Yager to still be doing this, it's great. But, yeah, he's no, he's not going to catch Gretzky. And really, yeah. it, it's tough. Who will? To, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Who, who really is ever going to catch Gretzky? I mean, the fact that second place is 1,891 and first place is 2,857, I mean, you know, maybe the only guy who could have ever got close was Mario Lemieux, um, and he's sitting eighth overall. So, I, I mean, you know, it, it's it's tough to say nowadays that anybody will get anywhere close. I mean, Gretzky had 100-point seasons through most of his career, and then, you know, a couple of seasons where in 81-82 he had 212 points in the season, and in 85-86 he had 215. You know, I had four 200-point seasons in his career. I mean, nobody's... People struggle to reach 100 points now. Uh, I mean, it's, it, nobody's ever going to reach that mark. Yeah, it's going to be tough, you know. And I, I'm looking at the list of the top 10, uh, you know, and, and you have just – it's just crazy looking at this list. And, and you see all the players on there, Messi, how Eisenman, uh, Lemieux, Sackick, all these guys, you know, that ended up in, in the high 1,000s, you know, uh, 1,600, 1,700 and the games played and whatnot – then it's gonna be it's gonna be tough. I mean, you look at the points per game uh, with uh, Gretzky, and you know he he almost is you know getting almost two points per game. It's freaking ridiculous. You know the only closest one after that, so one you mentioned was uh, Lemieux, and obviously Lemieux with his health issues and whatnot, he, he had to you know stop early, which was a shame. Um, but yeah, I mean that's just crazy. Uh, congrats to Yager. Uh, he'll probably be second for a while. And Gretzky, I don't know if anybody's ever going to get close to that. But uh, with that, we're going to wrap up the show. I hope you enjoyed it. I uh, hope you had a happy, uh, you know, and safe uh, Christmas and New Year's. Um, we'll be back next week. And uh, make sure to check out the website. Uh, we've started to upload more of the videos and, and whatnot and the recaps. Uh, and if you're missing some articles, you didn't see something, just, just go to thepucknetwork.com. Everything's listed on there. And uh, with that, let's go Ducks.